please join us as we begin our illustrated message, The Dock. Can we see? Are we blind to the plight right in front of our eyes? The ripping, the roaring of all of life's big waves. It tears at the seams of our hearts and our homes. It is not exclusive to the young or to the old. It is seen in our families, our schools, and our streets. Our businesses affected, our neighbors face the heat. Exhausted, depleted, no way to get out. The fight in their heart no longer able to raise a shout. Hands raised in defeat amidst the waves. Surrender to whatever may come their way. Drowning in hurt, disappointment, and pain. Not knowing that help is one whisper away. Where to go, what to say, who will listen, will it be okay? The question cyclone around in our minds like a torrent of storms that none can deny. Will we see? Will we act? It's hard to say. I know one thing, Jesus would come their way. He was wrapped in flesh and walked among us, got dirty, was mistreated all for the love that he had for the broken, those drowning in hurt, sin and pride. It was for they that he stretched forth his arms and died. He rose from the grave with one simple mission to hand us a net. And he said, go fishing. The fields are ripe. We don't have to pray for opportunity to come our way. It's right in front of us, all around, so much so that if we are quiet, you can hear the sounds. The sounds of children in need of hope, the cries of your neighbor for a legitimate friend, or the deepest thoughts of your coworker to simply be invited in. If we look no further than the dock that we call our church past the sidewalk, we will see the broke. It's disguised by a smile, a handshake, a joke, sometimes all contact avoided, afraid to hope. Whatever the package, the need is clear. A need to know that Jesus Christ is near, nearer than you realize. He's close at hand, no matter your present or even your past. He's not here to judge, to hurt, or find blame. He's here to forgive, restore. And all you must do is simply call on his name. The call is clear and the scene is set. Christ died so that all could find life, be raised from the dead through the love that he gives. It's time to rise and leave the dock, Bethel Church. When we rise, the tide will come in with changed lives, restored homes, healed bodies, and minds. Let's go. Let's do this. The time is now. The Silicon Valley is waiting for hope to be found. Never far from the national conversation is the Titanic, a ship that was built to boast the accomplishment of man, a ship deemed unsinkable that would, in fact, on its maiden voyage, sink. The name Titanic has become synonymous with colossal failures, overestimations, people dying. What a lot of people don't know is that before Titanic went down, she signaled another ship called the California, informing California that she had hit an iceberg and that there was big trouble at hand. California arrived too late. People died. People were in the water dead when California arrived. They just didn't get there in time. Incredible how many times people die simply because somebody didn't get there in time. Because people who can help, who have the ability to help, who have the knowledge to help, are busy. They're preoccupied or uninterested to be concerned about their play. Catherine Genovese was coming home from her night job early on an April morning. She headed to her home in New York, and she was attacked. As a matter of fact, she was attacked on three separate occasions as she tried to get to her door. As she was stabbed repeatedly, 
and lay dying on her doorstep screaming for help. The police later found out that 38 residents in her neighborhood watched the murder take place and refused to act. A sense of shock and outrage swept our nation and Senator Russell from Georgia read the New York Times article into the congressional record about this crime. In our world, all around us, people are in the surf. People are drowning. San Jose, Santa Clara are filled with people who need somebody to care, somebody to get involved, somebody to get there in time. The Silicon Valley, home to great tech companies and where innovators, trailblazers, and entrepreneurs come to shape a global industry. With a population of nearly three million people, the melding of cultures and people from all around the world, and the status of living in the tech capital, it is one of the most desired areas in the nation to live. But don't look too close. This valley also contains the nation's fifth largest homeless population, an overload on our drug and gang task forces, a skyrocketing cost of living index, and an estimated 48% of marriages ending in divorce. For some, there is a promising dream here. For others, a disparaging outlook. But no matter the outlook, Jesus is the answer. This is the Silicon Valley. I lived a life dependent on drugs, alcohol, and acceptance from people whom I thought were friends, yet led me deeper into sin. However, I had a family who prayed for me and never gave up, that kept inviting me to church and encouraging me that God is able to set me free. I gave my life to Christ in October of 2004, and today I stand here letting you know that God has delivered me from that lifestyle and has given me the peace of knowing I am free from addiction and the need for acceptance. I grew up in a home with my mom, my dad, and my little sister. We had a great family, a great home, and a great life. But as I got older, my parents began to fight more and more. They divorced when I was in middle school, and I felt lost and confused. I thought that if my parents couldn't love each other, how could they ever love me? It wasn't until my freshman year in high school that I discovered what real love really looked like. I was invited to Bethel Church for an Amped event in the spring. In July of 2011, I gave my life to Christ, and I've served Jesus on my campus, in my church, and in my family ever since. To be honest, my life before Jesus seemed great. I had friends all around me. I had a great time at the parties. I was doing just fine roaming the downtown streets of San Jose. It wasn't until I was brought to Bethel that God helped me realize I was completely lost with no direction. Yet God was so good to me that his love for me brought me to my knees in November of 2010 and I gave my life to him. He has given me a purpose and a passion to be in ministry and to love others the way he loved me. Growing up was hard. We were homeless most of the time. At the end of my eighth grade year, my mom died of a drug overdose. I felt lost, abandoned, and I really believed that no one loved me. I turned to drugs, alcohol, smoking, and I didn't care about anything. I liked the escape from the pain. I was in and out of juvenile hall and jails. Seeing my fear, a fellow inmate introduced me to Jesus Christ. I joined Celebrate Recovery while in prison and was baptized. God has given me a new start, a new life, a new family, and he's rebuilding me. After drifting away from our foundation of God and being tossed about by the storms of divorce and life on our own, we both found our way back to the light. And now reconnected to Jesus and joined to each other, not only have we come back to the Lord, we are serving other hurting lost people through divorce care. Seeing people rebuild their lives and come to know Jesus as Savior and attending Bethel has been an amazing experience. God has taken the broken remains of two damaged people and combined us into a loving, secure recovery and restoration ministry. I was born and raised in Lexington, Kentucky. I grew up in a divorced, abusive home. I came to know the Lord as a child, but fell away. After many years of drugs, alcohol, and chronic homelessness, I hit rock bottom. I rededicated my life to Christ, baptized at 20 years old. Though I continue to struggle, I remain faithful. I am Joshua, I'm a recovering addict, and above all, I am a Christian. 
Growing up, I was lost and insecure. I was broken on the inside and the out. I thought, how could I be loved when my own father wasn't there to love me? At my lowest, I broke. As I fell down onto my knees, I heard a voice saying, it's okay, I'm here. That day, I found a real father, someone who would never leave. This is a true father, someone who stays with me. This is how my life changed. I am the Silicon Valley. 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 The water around us is turbulent. It's violent. It destroys the old and the young alike. Personal strength and willpower are no match for its effects. It's fierce currents. The water pulls and tears at people, exhausts them to the point that many simply give up the fight. The waters I'm talking about today are not limited to an ocean or to a river, but rather they're everywhere you look. In the halls of your school, in the grocery store, the place where you buy your gasoline, some of your homes, the waters rage and people are fighting against this hostile force. Ephesians 4.14 says, Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by cunning craftiness of men and their deceitful scheming. We don't have to live a life at the mercy of the waters. But left to our own, that's exactly where we are. There are people in our society, and nobody knows about the turbulence in their home, the bullying that they put up with at school, all because they profess a Christian lifestyle and they're the only one. No one understands the turbulence trying to raise children in the Silicon Valley. Mom and dad are both working there's very little left over for either one of them when they get home. No one knows about the turbulence in his mind, the bankruptcy that he's contemplating, the stress and the struggles at work trying to make it work. Nobody knows the turbulence of a deadly disease and a nest egg that's almost been exhausted because of the sickness. In this water, People are in trouble. People that you just saw, people in trouble, dependent upon somebody else to help them to a point of safety. They can't swim to safety because they simply don't know the way to go. In addition, they're weighed down as they fight the waves and as they fight the currents. They're weighed down by materialism gender confusion, social pressures, bullying, financial stresses. Though it may not be obvious to you, though it may not be obvious to the naked eye, these people are scared and they need somebody to help. They're terrified of the effects and their inability to get out of the water. Where is God in all of this? Where is God's plan for a city that's number 10 in the nation and a valley with such need? The answer to this incredible set of circumstances, the answer is the church. It's not this building it's you, and it's me, and it's what we do when we leave this church that fashions the response of God to a hurting society. This is a worship service, but service begins when you leave this property to a world that hurts. In full view of this church are people going under, losing strength, losing hope. God has placed this church, a dock, at the edge of this dramatic scene. 
This wood structure is a dock, a place of safety at the edge of the water. It's been strategically placed at the water's edge so that it can help people who are in the surf of this culture. The dock is dry. It's a refuge from the turmoil and the stress of life. It's a place where many lives have been rescued and pulled back from death. It is elevated, raised so people in the water can see it. It's visible from a great distance and able to be seen. Unfortunately, not everybody on the dock is aware of the purpose for which the dock was built. Many people use the dock for many different things. The dock is in full view of the turbulent waters of life. Many choose to utilize the dock for their purposes and not the purpose for which it was established. It's great to remember that this place exists for the need of our neighborhood, for those who hurt, for those whose lives are a mess, those who are desperate, those who are short on hope and long on sorrow, those who also live lives that are seemingly okay, but they just feel as though something's really missing. Today we begin a series called Upside Down Living. We're going to explore some of the claims that Jesus made, claims that are counterculture. In some of the cases, they're counterintuitive, backwards to the world that we live in. They seem upside down, <laughs> and yet they are the claims of Jesus. Next week begins a significant season in the life of this church, the fall. Next week, we also begin a month that we have labeled very simply as Friend Month. For the next four weeks, we encourage you to bring a friend each week with you to church. Each week, I will bring a message of hope through the lens of a claim that Jesus made upside down to our culture, but right where it needs to be for the kingdom of God. This day is a day of preparation, a reminder of what the dock, the church is all about and why this dock was built, why God established this church where he did. Upside down living is only possible when we look at the church and remind ourselves of its purpose. We will then and only then be able to reach what we are meant to be. Unfortunately, the purposes of the church, the idea of being fishers and men has gone through some interesting changes. Let's look together at how many view and utilize the dock, all the while overlooking what's really, really important, the people in the water. Gotta be real quiet if you're gonna get the big one. Don't worry, I got this system down and someday I'm gonna get something we're talking about. I ain't talking about no little guy. I'm talking big. I'm talking huge. You gotta sit back. You gotta get comfortable. You gotta be quiet. You gotta be patient. You can't go chasing them. You gotta let them come to you. Be ready. With a three inch hook and lure. Right. Yeah, I got everything I need right here. I'm comfortable. My friends, they give me these shiny things. They try to help me and stuff. Mm -mm. No, no, no. I'm going to use old faithful. <laughs> See? And I got all the tools. When I, when I get that big sucker, I'm going to bring them up, and I'm going to hit them over the head with my trusty hammer. I don't know how I'm going to get them over the dock. I haven't figured that out yet, but that's okay. I'm going to be ready when that happens. Here, fishy, fishy. Here, fishy, fishy. Is that one? Is that one? Oh, I can't lose my stuff. What happened? Here it is. I found it. This is it. I got it. I got it. Uh, it's happening. It's really, this is the day. This is the day. The, the, oh. When Jesus called us to be fishers of men, I'm pretty sure this guy isn't what he had in mind. Jesus did not call us to sit comfortably by, hoping that someday people would find their way to us. 
This man's more concerned about techniques and the way he looks and his personal comfort than he is about catching fish. A real fisherman studies the patterns of fish. He knows the things they feed on, where they go, what they need. All of this so they can be effective at catching the fish. One last thing. To catch fish, you have to go to where the fish are. In their environment. No fisherman would ever wait for fish to come to him, to his home. Fish exist, but in their environment. Jesus has called us to be fishers of men, fishing for souls. It isn't sport, it isn't image, it isn't optional. What it is, is a matter of life and death. Okay, okay, you got this. All right, here we go. No, 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 no! I can't do it. I'm not ready. I mean, look at me. I'm not even prepared enough. Okay. I mean, I've heard that the undertow here is like really, 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 really strong. And I've heard that in some seasons, it gets even stronger. I mean, I don't know what season it is. What if I get in the water in the wrong season? I could just get swept away. There you go. See you later. No, 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 no. I mean, okay, sure. I've been swimming for a while now, and yeah, I've taken a couple classes at the YMCA, and I was on the college swim team, sure, and I'm first aid certified, and I'm trained in search and rescue, yeah, 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 yeah. But what good is that stuff gonna do me if I get caught in an undertow? I don't know what to do in an undertow. You know what? I got an idea. Maybe, maybe just one more. Mm hmm. Okay, here we go. All right. Now I think I might be ready. In three, two, one. Wait a minute. Whoa, 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 whoa. I just had a thought. I had a thought. What if there's a shark? Whoa, whoa, wait a minute. What is that? That looks like a shark. What did I tell you, people? Shark! 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 Everybody out of the water, women and children first. Save the children! Save the children! Oh. Ooh. Sorry, folks. Sorry. False alarm. As you were. That was only a drill. I mean, how was I supposed to know it was just going to be some kid goofing off in the water? I mean, he should know better than to have his boogie board flipped over like that and just bobbing out of the water that way. Ugh, give a guy a heart attack, why don't you? Ugh. But what if it were a shark? I could have been eaten alive. Ugh. We've all seen Jaws, and I'm not ready for that kind of encounter. Mm -mm. I mean, I haven't been trained. I mean, what if I'm in the water and a shark just comes up next to me and says, hey, how are you doing? I don't know what to do there. I haven't been equipped for that. Besides, I've heard, I've heard that sharks mistake people for seals like all the time. What if they think I am a seal? I mean, I look the part. Ugh, no, no, no. Ugh. You know what I need to do? I need to take a class. Mm-hmm. A shark attack survival class. There you go. Just one more class, and then maybe, maybe I can get in that water. Yeah. I just need to take another class. I need to study, to learn here, where it's safe. <sighs> Let the professionals go out and deal with all the challenges of being in that water. I'm fine right here. Mm -mm. Kind of a sad picture, both his outfit and his attitude. People waiting until they're ready, in their mind. But the reality is all different. Jesus met a woman at a well in the middle of the day. A five-time marital loser who had all kinds of issues and problems and struggles. And after a conversation with Jesus, she acknowledges him as the Messiah. And her life changes. 
Jesus sent her back into the town. A believer for only moments, but Jesus sent her back into the town. To do what? Just to tell her story. You're never too young in your faith to tell your story. It's never too early for you to tell your story to somebody else about what Jesus has done for you. Is training important? Yes. Is discipleship important? A must. Is maturity important? Yes, and it will come. Is there built-in waiting periods from the time that you, built, you, you meet Jesus till the time you get to tell your story to somebody who's lost? No. You're good to go right now. I've been getting better at this game. I've been practicing. I've been studying about players who are a lot better than I am. I've been practicing a lot. <laughs> I got the right shoes on. <clears throat> I've been eating all the right foods that my coaches recommend. But you know, I just, I just don't know exactly what I need to do to get better. Maybe some two ball drills, maybe that'll help improve what I'm doing. I just have to stay competitive. Because those younger girls are going to pass me up. Wow. <laughs> you know what? I'm a basketball player. That's who I am. That's what people expect me to be. You know what? I'm glad they have a basketball program here. Wow. It's time for me to practice and play. I need all the practice I can get. But you know, I love it. But that's why I'm here, actually. This church has made me a better basketball player. But you know what? I need to get better. I need to keep my focus. No distractions. This is my focus. <laughs> hey, what's going on out there? Oh, look at all those people. What's, wow, look at that. They're just splashing around. Wow, look at that. They, they can't even swim. Oh, my. That's pathetic. Look at that. They need to spend a little bit more time with me. Then they would get their priorities straight. Wow. I would never be caught dead in a situation like that. I need to keep on honing my skills, thinking about myself. There we go. I will not end up like them. Sports are great. I love them. I love watching sports. I love watching your team and hassling you about your team. When my team plays your team and beats your team, it's one of my best days ever. I love sports, love to participate in them, although there are fewer and fewer <laughs> I'm qualified to participate in as I get older. I'm glad that we offer athletic programs here at Bethel Church, but that's not the reason we exist. Sports are a huge deal in people's lives, but they're not as important as souls. I have all my life watched people make a priority call while they're chasing footballs, basketballs, baseballs, running around a track with fervor. They're putting other things on hold. Moms and dads who literally pull their kids out of church for seasons because a sport is going on. Kids who can't go on a missions trip through three years of high school because of sports camps. Well, pastor, what are you saying? Are we just supposed to quit sports? No, I'm not saying quit sports. Use the sport, use the gym, the, the baseball diamond, the basketball court, the gridiron to be able to be a witness and to help people who are hurting in that part of our society. Don't quit. Start. Start using what God has enabled you to do to get people out of the water. All right, right this way. My name is Christine. I'll be your server this evening. Here's your table. All right, now can I get you just started with something to drink? I think we'll both have waters, and uh, Christy, I'll have a Shirley Temple. Okay, we'll oh, do. Oh, I'm 
two cherries, not just one. All right, I'll be right back with this. Thank you for bringing me here again. I love this place. To be able to sit right here by the water and eat, so relaxing. Uh, it's a perfect place after a long day at work. I'm so glad you suggested that we come here. I am too, except, I don't know. I thought it was a bit tacky, that homeless man sitting right in the doorway begging for money. I don't know about you, but I felt a little uncomfortable even coming in here tonight. Can't they just make him go away? Don't they? <sighs> Don't they have places for people like that? Oh, lovey dear, I know exactly what you mean. And before we leave, I am going to talk to management and get him taken care of. Look at all these people swimming. What are they doing? They're wrecking my view. I'm going to talk to management about them, too. Thank you. You're so thoughtful. So, see anything on the menu you like? Yeah, a couple things. Mm -hmm. You know, honey, talk about things that make you uncomfortable. On Sunday, when they asked about giving money at church, that really got to me. I don't think going to church should make you feel guilty. What do you think? I completely agree. And it wasn't just this last Sunday, it's every week. Talking about how the Bible commands us to give 10% of our money. That's a lot. I know. We already tithed on our income tax return and our stock dividends. What more do they expect? I know, and we just don't have it. All right, I'm back to take your order. But before I do, let me tell you about our special tonight. It is a sautéed calamari in mushroom sauce over a bed of rice. Ooh, that sounds great. How much is that? That's oh, honey, why, why would you need to ask that? You know it doesn't matter what the cost is. It's $59.95, ma'am. Is that all? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'll have that. Great. Great, and for you, sir? Uh, I'm gonna have the lobster and prime rib. Okay, now that's gonna be $125. I, no, that's fine, medium rare. Okay, all right, I'll be right back with that. You know what I really appreciate about you? It's that you love to spend money on me. Where do we even start with this couple? <laughs> the need is obvious, but it serves only to irritate them and to create an inconvenience for them. What a sad statement is being made here. They're so caught up in themselves. They're so caught up in their own comfort that they simply view others' needs as an irritation. Can I remind you? that nobody likes to be in need. Nobody likes to be homeless. Nobody likes to be hungry. People run around broke and confused and hurt and hopeless. They have regret over their divorce. They have remorse over their loss of employment. And these issues make up a turbulent ocean in their life that they simply are wearing out trying to swim through. People are drowning in the surf and they don't like it. As followers of Jesus, it's a great thing for us to remember that the reason you've been blessed, the reason you have, the reason you have that stuff is so that you can bless others who are in need. I love this place, for my kids, I mean. It's important that they get in good instruction for, with morality and kindness towards others. They really get what they need here. I feel good that they'll be, they'll be safe on the play equipment and that they'll make good friends here. I'm glad to come here for them. Coming here really isn't for me, but my kids, they need this. This place offers great programs for Billy and Sarah. They do an excellent job with vacation Bible school swim lessons and even upward boating and fishing programs. 
they really get what they need here. Things that will help them succeed in life. It's good for them. And I don't mind taking advantage of the programs. The classes, lessons, trips, activities. But the best thing of all is everyone is really nice here. It's not for me, but I'll keep coming though for my kids. How sad to come here for your kids and miss out for you. You come to the parking lot, you're greeted by friendly people, you interact, you sit in the facility waiting for your children to finish their activity or to finish their class, but you're missing out. Your kids need to be here. Your kids need to be in this church. Your kids need to be exposed to the presence of God. Your kids need to learn about prayer. They need to learn about Jesus. They need that, but so do you. And can I just tell you, every child that's ever brought here, we do our very best. But mom, dad, we're not good enough to take your place. It doesn't matter what the class or what the activity while you're skipping everything else, we'll do it, but we can't take your place. By far the greatest example that will ever be given to your children of how to pray and how to enjoy God's presence and how to attend church and how to benefit from being around Jesus will come from you, not from us. We're gonna keep doing our best. Sure wish you'd come in. Let us take care of you too because we just can't do it without you. Love to watch these young people fish. <laughs> Look at them go. Ah, the passion of youth. I remember those days, 17 years old, having fun, living life, really living for Jesus going on mission trips, having church outreaches. I remember one outreach, must have been 30 years ago. We decided to show the love of Jesus to our community. We washed cars, we cleaned yards, we had a barbecue and a gospel presentation. We must have had over 200 people come to Jesus that day. Ah, I remember like it was yesterday. I remember sharing Jesus with one man. He accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as his Savior. Nothing else like it. Ah, those were the days. Ah, I had my days. Yeah, it's important while you're young to have those experiences, to serve the church. I remember the days teaching Sunday school classes, going on outreaches, chaperoning mission trips. I used to really give my time. But uh, those days are past. I decided to pass the baton on to the younger generation. It's their turn. I've just grown past those days. But still, I'm excited to see young people excited about Jesus Christ like I was. On one side today, we've seen a young man who deems himself unqualified because he's too new to accomplish anything for God. Now on the other side, we see an individual who has disqualified himself because he's too seasoned, too experienced. It's sad to watch people who accept self-manufactured excuses over Bible-based commands. God's not done with you, my friend. Regardless of your age, regardless of the years you've served, 
as long as God gives you breath and life, the purpose of God is at work in your life. Don't ever believe that it is another generation's responsibility to do what God has uniquely qualified you to do for him. Don't ever believe that the best is behind you. For all of us, the best is always just ahead. Praise God. Oh God, as I kneel and hear these heart-wrenching cries for help, I pray that you will go to those people and comfort them in their time of need. Lord, I pray that they are able to find safety through your guidance and help. Please bring someone into their lives who could give them what they need so that they could find you and learn to serve you as I am. I pray that you will do this so that your name will be glorified as they come to know you and follow you. Please give the people who will be ministering to them your wisdom and courage so that they may do an effective job of reaching these lost, hurting souls. Father God, I know that you don't want anyone to perish, but for all to find the truth. That truth which is you, why can't they see that? Shouldn't they know about you? Lord, my heart burns for them to know you more and to know about your grace and salvation. Lord, I ask that you will open their eyes to see that you can save them as they drown in their sins. Amen. Beautiful prayer. But as your pastor, can I remind you that prayer is never enough. Prayer must accompany action. James 2.17 says, in the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. It's great to pray. It's great to pray prayers like that. Many of us need to pray more. But the word of God is not complimentary to people who claim to have faith but do nothing about the needs that are right in front of them. People who talk to God but ignore a brother who has need, those friends are missing it altogether. They're hungry, and you say to them, Go be filled. They're cold and they're naked, and you say, go be warm. They're alone, and you say, go enjoy friendship. What good is that? It requires us praying and then getting up off our knees and going out and interacting and doing what we need to do. This guy is so busy praying and trying to not be like the world that he's missing the privilege of ministering to the world. If you want to be like Jesus, you're going to have to spend some time with people that Jesus loves passionately and died for them. This guy needs to get out of the prayer closet and get in touch with the hurting world. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Pray. Do. Man, there is so many people out there. How could I even begin to help? Hey, those guys out there rescuing people, they don't have the, uh, enough resources uh, to do their job effectively. How could I even begin to help? There must be something I can do. Hey, my name is Mark Afshar. I'm a missionary to the college campus of UC Davis. Come on. Excited. Uh, giving the devil an uppercut. 
you quickly realize when you get on a college campus, you might not necessarily be able to preach Jesus Christ and get a whole bunch of college students to listen to you, right? You might be with me on that one. But you might be able to do some rap, hip hop, to some college students, something like this. I ain't got two chains, but I know someone who took three nails. Name is Jesus. Ever heard of him? Go ahead and check your Gmail. That's God mail, right? Something like that. You'll get a whole bunch of students to come on out. All right, all right, y'all can give a hand clap. You'll get a whole bunch of college students to come on out, right? One evening, we were on our way to our uh, weekly gathering service. We take over a lecture hall at the university at UC Davis there. Uh, this is the same lecture hall where professors that entire day, they'll, they'll, uh, they won't te they'll teach ideas contrary to God. Uh, there is no Genesis 1 uh, being taught in the classroom. There might be a girl named Genesis up in there, but there is no Genesis in the Bible uh, being taught. In there. And, I've, and I've been in these classes too. I was a biology major. And uh, there will be some professors that will actually encourage their students to engage in promiscuous behavior to decrease their stress levels during final examinations. Right? So we're on our way to our weekly gathering. We'll do worship, preaching, all that stuff. But on our way, we were passing by these fraternity and sorority houses uh, to our weekly gathering on campus. And uh, I felt like the Holy Spirit saying, Mark, I need you to go into this frat house where these guys were having their social gathering, uh, having a party, and speak to this one individual. So I said, okay, I got to get to the meeting, but hey, I'll go stop in this uh, frat party. I go in, not knowing what to say, I speak to this one individual. And uh, I don't remember really too much what I said, but I do remember this, saying, hey, Jesus loves you. He has a planned purpose for your life. And I feel like there's been some wor negative words that were spoken over you, almost like a curse spoken over you. And I believe that Jesus wants to set you free, right? We finish the conversation. I walk away, begin to intercede, pray for this young man, say, Jesus, save him, transfer him from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, draw him by your spirit, do all that kind of stuff, right? A few days later, he gets in contact with us, weeping, sobbing, gets right with God, gives his life to Jesus Christ, comes to our fall retreat, gets baptized in the Holy Spirit, starts speaking in tongues, has an encounter, gets wrecked by God, and he, it's, not, it's not done yet. He has a dream. He sees Jesus in his dream. This guy's name is Freddie, and he, and he sees Jesus calling him out. He says, Freddie, you are clean. You are clean. It ain't over yet. This past summer, Freddie, he went out to Central Asia, Asia to a predominantly Muslim nation uh, we, we send our students there every summer, and uh, you hear the Muslim call to prayer in every neighborhood uh, place you go to, but he's out there preaching, proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ, saves and sets people free. Well, he comes back, he's now the vice president of his fraternity, and he says, Mark, if you want to join my fraternity, you got to put your hand on the Bible, say, I believe in the Bible, I believe that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior, otherwise you ain't getting to my fraternity, right? Je come on. Jesus Christ saves sinners to save sinners. Just a few weeks ago, he was telling me, Mark, I brought 18 of my fraternity members with me to church. They all heard about the gospel. Isn't that awesome? Come on, somebody. Somebody got to get excited about that. But let me tell you guys how important this is right here. This will help uh, those who are working uh, in the field, uh, those who are rescuing people out of the water uh, to effectively do their job. And, hey, what's something else, something more that we can do? we can go out there and do the work with them. And so Bethel Church, I want to thank you guys for help giving me what I need to get out the dock. God bless you guys. Amen. Come on, sister. I love this guy. It's like somebody plugged him into 220. He came into my office and I thought, I am in big, big trouble when I met Mark. This is one of the missionaries Bethel Church supports on a monthly basis. Aren't you glad to meet a guy like this? We are interested in doing a good job in the turbulence of society at UC Davis too. That's why we have a partnership like this. And every month when you give money into general missions, part of that is going to Mark and his brand new wife. They just got married, got home from their honeymoon last night. <laughs> it is the sign of a mature church that they care about missions. And it's a sign of a mature believer too, that they care enough about missions to get part of what they have. So the guy like this, can represent us and do what he's doing on that campus. God bless you, Mark. We're proud of your efforts.
Every time you get by the water, you see a structure like this. Whether it's a lake or an ocean, a swimming pool. There's always somebody sitting in the tower. Their eyes are trained on the water. Making sure that if anybody gets into trouble, they can get to them and they can help them. The people that sit in chairs like this aren't just there working on their tan. They're there making a life and death difference in somebody's life that is having a problem. This lifeguard tower is depicted as empty today because the surf is full of people who need help. Any good lifeguard would be out of the tower if they understood the need that is present in our society. The lifeguard tower stands empty because the lifeguards need to get out there. The dock stands empty because all of the people who have been on the dock need to be into the surf bringing people back to safety. Bethel Church, we exist for the pleasure and for the privilege of bringing people ashore that are lost in the surf in the turbulence of a generation. Next week starts Friend Month. For one month, we're going to ask you to bring a friend with you to church. The same friend for weeks or a different friend every week. We're going to ask that you bring somebody with you to this place. And every week, I'm going to preach a message that is based on a claim that Jesus made. And I'm going to bring a message of hope to your friend, to your neighbor, to your coworker, to your ex-spouse. And every week, I'm gonna give your friend or neighbor or coworker an opportunity to accept Jesus into their life. We are expecting to see people pulled from the, from the surf onto this dock all during this next four weeks. I'm gonna pray for you this morning. And as I do, I want you to ask God to put somebody's name or their face on your mind or in your heart that you could go and invite. And I'm going to pray today and I'm going to ask God that he would prepare them to receive your invitation. Statistics tell us a high percentage of people would go to church if they were just invited by somebody. Let's get off the dock. Let's get out of a worship service drive-by signs that say you are now entering the mission field and then focus on service to people who are in the, surf, in the surf of their life. Let me pray for you this morning. Father, we give you thanks because you deem us worthy to be involved in the most important mission of mankind, building your kingdom. Everything else, God, is temporal. Your kingdom is eternal. And God, I pray today for men, women, and young people that this week, God, you would help them as they approach a neighbor or a coworker or a friend. That God, you would prepare those people's hearts to be open to an invitation. Every one of them, God, you love. Every one of these friends you are passionate about. And now, God, we ask that you would simply prepare their minds and their spirits for this encounter before we even leave this service. Father, help us as we leave this place and walk by and drive by a sea of need around this church. Use us for your glory and honor. And while your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, I want to lead you in one more prayer. Maybe you're here today and you'd say that drowning in the surf sounds pretty much like my life. The issues, the problems, the struggles that I'm going through, I need Jesus to help me. I'm going to lead you in a prayer right now. And if you'd like Jesus to come into your life and forgive you of your sin and to partner with you in the living of your life, 
living the plan that God designed specifically for you, I would invite you just to repeat this prayer after me. God will hear every word. I don't want to preach a sermon about the dock and then not give you an opportunity. Let's pray together. Quietly, right where you sit, repeat this after me. Dear Jesus, thank you for loving me. Thank you for caring enough about me that you left heaven. Thank you for dying on a cross for my sins. I accept you into my life now. And I ask that you help me live the life the way God designed me to live it. I declare two things in this prayer. That you're my Savior, and I declare that you are my Lord. Thank you for hearing my prayer. In the name of Jesus. Amen.